Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harriton, and in this video we are going to go over some myths surrounding the foraging, the harvesting, and the consumption of wild mushrooms. If you've been interested in foraging mushrooms, or perhaps you have been foraging mushrooms for many years, you've probably come across some statements that may or may not be true. Perhaps you've read some things in books, or have seen people post things online, or you heard from a neighbor, or heard from a great uncle about their experiences foraging mushrooms, and you heard some general rules of thumb that sound kind of fishy, and you're wondering if they hold any firm basis in reality. And I've been teaching the skills involved in foraging mushrooms for many years, so I've heard all different kinds of general rules of thumb, or general statements that are actually just myths whenever you look at them. So that's what we're going to do in this video, explore some of these myths surrounding the foraging, the harvesting, and the consumption of wild mushrooms. Number one, if a mushroom is growing on a tree, then it is safe for consumption. This is entirely a myth, and it's one that I hear quite often, surprisingly. Yes, there are plenty of edible mushrooms that grow directly on trees, mushrooms like oyster mushrooms, chicken of the woods, the beefsteak polypore, and plenty of others. Many medicinal mushrooms grow directly on trees as well. However, there are plenty of poisonous mushrooms that grow directly on trees, whether the trees are living or dead. Such mushrooms would include the deadly Gallerina, Gallerina marginata. Jack-o'-lantern mushrooms grow directly from wood. Hyphaloma fasciculari, the sulfur-tuft mushroom. Even the poison pigskin puffball, which can grow terrestrially, but oftentimes it's found growing directly on wood. All of these are considered to be toxic fungi, and they grow directly on trees. So just because a mushroom is growing on a tree, that says nothing about its edibility status. And there are many mushrooms that grow directly on trees where the edibility status is unknown. So just because a mushroom is growing on a tree does not mean it's edible, does not mean it's medicinal, does not mean it's poisonous. It just means that it's growing on a tree. Number two, there are no toxic polypore mushrooms. This is a myth. Now I remember when I first started foraging wild mushrooms that I was told that there are no toxic polypore mushrooms. Later I learned that there are toxic polypore mushrooms. And if you're unfamiliar with polypore mushrooms, these are typically shelf-like mushrooms that typically grow on trees, though there are exceptions. And on the underside of the cap, you will see that there's a pore surface, which is actually a surface comprised of tubes that end in pores, many pores, hence that term polypore. Now there is at least one toxic polypore here in North America, and there probably are more. And the one that is well known is the tender nesting polypore, Hapalopolis nigilans, also known as Hapalopolis rutilans. This is a brown, cinnamon brown annual fungus that grows directly on wood, and you look at the underside of the cap and you see that there is a pore surface. So this is a polypore that contains a toxic compound known as polyperic acid. It contains a lot of it. Up to 40% of the dry weight of this fungus is polyperic acid. And if you would ingest enough of polyperic acid, this would lead to dysregulation of central nervous system function as well as kidney dysfunction. So you definitely do not want to consume that polypore mushroom. So there are toxic polypore mushrooms. That's just one. There are probably more, but just because a mushroom is a polypore does not mean that it's safe for consumption. Number three, if an animal eats it, then it is safe for human consumption. This is a myth. Just because you see a wild animal consuming a wild mushroom, that doesn't mean that that mushroom is safe for you. Many wild animals can consume mushrooms that are toxic for human beings, but they are edible for those animals. So it should come as no surprise that there are a lot of mycophagous animals in nature, and perhaps the most commonly observed mycophagous mammals include squirrels and chipmunks. But a lot of other animals consume mushrooms, a lot of beetles, slugs, and insects consume mushrooms. And just because you see these animals and insects and slugs consuming mushrooms, again, it doesn't mean it's edible for you. Feeding trials and field observations have shown that particularly squirrels and small rodents can consume some seriously toxic mushrooms for human beings, but they're edible for those animals. And also, just because a wild animal is eating it doesn't mean that that mushroom is safe for your pet. Cows, chickens, horses, and dogs can get very sick eating some mushrooms that would be edible for wild animals. So just because an animal is consuming a wild mushroom, that doesn't mean that it's edible for you. Number four, touching a poisonous mushroom is dangerous. This is a myth. I touch poisonous mushrooms all the time. Anytime I'm trying to identify a poisonous mushroom, I'm touching it. A lot of people touch poisonous mushrooms and they are fine. You can't absorb the toxins transdermally through your skin. You would have to eat the toxic mushroom in order for it to exert its effects on your body. So you can safely touch just about any wild mushroom that's out there, whether it's toxic or not. Now, of course, there are exceptions because some people are sensitive to certain mushrooms. For example, there's a genus known as the Suillus genus, 
which largely houses edible mushrooms, and the caps of many Suilla species are slimy and sticky, and some people are sensitive to that, and they develop itching and reddening and swelling in their skin. But it's only in a few select individuals. And again, those are actually edible mushrooms, and I enjoy eating Suillus mushrooms. Now, there might be one exception in this whole discussion about touching toxic mushrooms, and that would be an Asian fungus known as Podostroma cornudami. Now, I don't have any photographs to show you, so you're gonna have to look it up online. I don't have any photographs because it doesn't grow where I live. Now, that's a seriously toxic fungus. You do not want to ingest it. Some people claim you cannot touch it either because it'll exert its toxic effects even if you touch it. Now, it seems like it might be just a rumor that's being spread around. It's hard to find any confirmation on that statement. But if you're worried about touching toxic fungi, maybe just be worried about Podostroma cornudami. But for the vast majority of people, you could touch any wild mushroom that's out there. Number five, smelling unknown mushrooms is dangerous. This is a myth that I honestly don't hear too often, but I hear it enough that I thought I'd include it in this video. You could safely smell just about any wild mushroom that's out there. And this is a useful way to get a positive ID for many mushrooms. So for instance, this one smells kind of like anise or licorice-y, somewhat fishy, somewhat mushroomy. This is an oyster mushroom. And you just want to take some quick whiffs. You don't want to put a hood over it and just inhale for minutes at a time because where the issue comes up is if you inhale a lot of spores and you are seriously immunocompromised, then you could develop a respiratory illness. For example, there's a respiratory illness known as lycoperidonosis, which is inflammation of the lung tissue brought about because of the inhalation of a lot of mature puffball spores. And puffballs can release billions, if not trillions of spores. It's a lot of spores and people who are immunocompromised can be seriously made ill through the inhalation of those spores. There's another fungus known as Schizophyllum commune, which is the split gill, which has been shown to colonize certain individuals' respiratory tracts after inhalation of the spores, but these are in seriously immunocompromised individuals. For the vast majority of people, you could safely smell just about any wild mushroom that's out there. Number six, once cooked, any mushroom is safe to eat. That is a myth. Now, there are a lot of nuances to what I'm about to say because there are some toxic fungi whose toxic profiles are not reduced whatsoever whenever you cook them. And there are some toxic mushrooms that are made edible after you do cook them. And there are some toxic compounds that are rendered inert after cooking. For example, there's a compound known as a garotene. It's a naturally derived phenylhydrazine compound that is found naturally occurring in the common button mushroom, Agaricus bispores. This compound is considered to be a weak carcinogen, but that compound's toxicity is mitigated after you cook that mushroom. And whenever we look at some mushrooms that are considered to be toxic raw, like the morel mushroom, you can cook that mushroom and make it edible. So morel mushrooms are toxic raw, but they're rendered edible after you cook them. And there are some other poisonous mushrooms that are poisonous raw, but after special preparation, they're rendered edible. And I'm not going to get into the specifics of those ones, but there are a lot of toxic fungi that remain very toxic, even if you would cook them like destroying angel mushrooms, death cat mushrooms, deadly gallerina, lepiota mushrooms, jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, even if you cook them, they're still very, very toxic. So once cooked, not every mushroom is made edible. It all depends on the mushroom. It all depends on the process. So you really have to learn each mushroom one at a time. You have to learn its edibility status one at a time. Number seven, a silver spoon will turn black in the presence of toxic mushrooms. This is clearly a myth. But interestingly, it's one that I've heard people tell me over and over again, asking me, is this true? Is it true that if you put a silver spoon in a pot of mushrooms that are being cooked, that the silver spoon will turn black if the mushrooms are toxic? Or if you put a silver coin in that pot of cooking mushrooms, that if the mushrooms are toxic, the coin will turn black? Well, it's not true. You can't put those things in a pot and a certain color change will tell you if the mushrooms are edible or not. But what's interesting is that this myth goes back quite some time. I'm not sure what the origins of this myth are, but it goes back quite some time, at least a century. I was reading a book published in 1894 that was talking about this myth and debunked this myth. And I'll quote the book and it says, it has been believed for a long time and some persons believe it still that a means to recognize whether a mushroom is hurtful or eatable is to use in the preparation of these plants, a spoon of silver or a ring of gold. If in the cooking of the mushrooms, the spoon or the ring turn black, it is hurtful. If they remain clear, it is innocent. And this was from a book called About Mushrooms, a guide to the study of esculent and poisonous fungi 
again published in 1894. And this quote was actually from another book, an older book. It was a French book that was published in 1876. A similar myth involves adding white onions to a pot of unknown mushrooms. And if the onion turns blue or brown, then those mushrooms were poisonous. And if the onion remains white, then those mushrooms were edible. That sounds like who could believe this today in the 21st century? But interestingly, people still apply those general rules of thumb when attempting to identify a wild mushroom or at least to determine its edibility status. For example, a recent toxicology report, 2012, so not too long ago, in the journal Nephrology Dialysis Transplantation, reported on a 55-year-old Italian woman who was admitted to the hospital with renal failure after consuming white mushrooms that she claimed she had been eating her whole life and she tested the edibility status of it with a silver spoon. And that silver spoon did not turn black, so she ate them thinking that they were edible. Turns out it was destroying her kidneys and the mushroom turned out to be a nephrotoxic amanita mushroom. So you can't determine the edibility status of an unknown mushroom using a silver spoon or using a silver coin. There are better ways to do it. Number eight, if a mushroom bruises blue, it's toxic. That is a myth. And now we're really talking about bolete mushrooms. These are terrestrial mushrooms to a large degree with cushiony caps with a pore surface on the underside. A lot of these mushrooms form ectomycorrhizal associations. And some of these mushrooms bruise blue whenever you scratch them or whenever you slice them in half. And various structures on the mushroom might turn blue. And so I remember when I was learning how to identify bolites early on, I was told that if it bruises blue, don't eat it because it's toxic. Well, since then, I've been eating a lot of bolete mushrooms that bruise blue, including Butyra boletus frostii, which is frost bolete, also Lanmaua palidorosia, which is another bolete mushroom that turns blue whenever you scratch it. So it doesn't mean that a mushroom is toxic if it bruises blue, but there are bolete mushrooms that do bruise blue and are toxic for many people. For example, there's a mushroom known as Boletus huronensis, which grows mostly in association with hemlock trees. It will slowly bruise blue in most instances, and that has caused some serious illnesses in some people. There's a genus known as Rubro boletus, which houses some toxic fungi that do bruise blue. So just because a bolete mushroom bruises blue, does not mean that it's edible, does not mean that it's toxic. All it means is that it bruises blue. Number nine, if a mushroom displays bright colors, it's toxic. That is a myth. There are a lot of brightly colored fungi that are edible. A lot of brightly colored fungi might be poisonous. A lot of brightly colored fungi could be considered medicinal as well. So it all depends on the species. I eat a lot of brightly colored mushrooms. Chicken of the woods is one perfect example. There's a genus known as the Russula genus, which houses a lot of ectomycorrhizal fungi with beautiful brightly colored fruiting bodies. Many of them are edible. The edibility of many is unknown, and some of them are considered to be toxic. The related Lactarius genus houses many edible mushrooms with brightly colored fruiting bodies. The Ganoderma genus is a genus of medicinal fungi, and those caps are typically lacquered and red in color, but they can display colors like orange and yellow as well. But the reverse is also true. Just because a mushroom has a light colored fruiting body or a mild colored fruiting body like white, that doesn't mean it's edible, doesn't mean it's toxic. There are many white toxic fungi, many white edible fungi as well. So color doesn't determine edibility of a wild mushroom. Number 10, mushrooms should not be consumed with alcohol. Now this is a myth to a large degree, but there are some nuances with what I'm about to say, so definitely pay attention. In the majority of cases, most wild mushrooms are well tolerated when consumed with alcohol, but there are some exceptions. And I understand that many people watching this video have probably consumed a lot of wild mushrooms in conjunction with alcohol with no ill effects. So when I say that most wild mushrooms are well tolerated when consumed in conjunction with alcohol, that must mean that there are a few wild mushrooms that aren't well tolerated. And that's because some wild mushrooms, only a few, contain a compound known as coprine. And coprine is a toxin that interferes with alcohol metabolism and causes disulfiram-like effects. And disulfiram is a drug that's used to treat people who suffer from chronic alcoholism by making them very sensitive to alcohol. So the effects of consuming alcohol with coprine-containing mushroom species includes rapid heart rate, palpitations, nausea, flushing of the face, tingling of extremities, and headaches. So which mushrooms contain coprine? Well, perhaps you've heard of the common ink cap mushroom, also appropriately called tippler's bane, Coprinopsis atramentaria. This mushroom is considered to be edible and generally safe to consume when cooked and eaten. 
without alcohol. However, it should not be consumed within 48 hours prior to or after consuming alcohol because the common ink cap mushroom contains coprine and a related compound known as benzocoprine. And ingestion of this combination can cause very unpleasant disulfiram-like effects. Now, Copronopsis atramentaria is not the only wild mushroom that contains coprine and benzocoprine. Other wild fungi that are taxonomically placed in the same genus, the Copronopsis genus, and in the sections Atramentariae, and also in the section Picaceae, are known to contain coprine and benzocoprine. So those are the fungi to watch out for. But for the vast majority of people and vast majority of edible mushrooms are generally accepted as safe to consume in conjunction with alcohol. But be aware that individual sensitivities always exist. Some people just can't consume, for example, chicken of the woods with alcohol, or morel mushrooms with alcohol, or hen of the woods with alcohol. Individual sensitivities do exist. Number 11, pulling up a mushroom by its roots is a poor harvesting technique. This is a myth for many reasons. First, mushrooms don't have roots in the true sense of the word root. Mushroom fruiting bodies are attached to mycelium, which is the vegetative network of the fungus, which is largely unseen. It's in the substrate, in the soil, or in the tree, or in an insect. And you might want to pull up a mushroom, or at least dig around the mushroom and get the whole thing out of the ground if you want to properly identify a wild mushroom because many key identifying features can be seen at the bottom of a mushroom. Of course, you'll want to cut a mushroom if you're just trying to harvest for the table to ensure a clean harvest, but for identification purposes, in many cases, you want to get the whole mushroom up out of the ground. And peer-reviewed research suggests that pulling or cutting a mushroom really has no discernible effects on future yields of fruiting bodies, nor on species richness within a given area. So pulling, cutting seem to be pretty comparable as far as their effects are involved on mushrooms. But again, if you want a clean harvest for the table for an edible mushroom, I'd recommend cutting the mushroom, but to get a proper identification, pull it up or dig around the mushroom to get the whole entire thing. Number 12, you can transplant mushrooms. This is a myth. You cannot just cut a mushroom or pull up a mushroom, take it to a new location, put it in the soil or put it in a substrate and expect it to thrive in that area and to take root there. Because remember, mushrooms don't have roots. They arise from mycelium. And so if you would pull up a mushroom, let's say a morel, put it in a new area and see new mushrooms there the next year, it would probably be because you dispersed spores to that new area. Or you can pull up mycelium in some instances, for example, in wood chips, take that to another area with wood chips. And if the conditions are right, you might see new fruiting bodies eventually in that area. Maybe not the next year, maybe the year after that. But as far as transplanting a mushroom by cutting it or pulling it up, putting it in the ground and expecting it to take root, that is a myth. Number 13, harvesting mushrooms in mesh bags or baskets is essential for spore dispersal. Now this is a good sentiment and I understand the thinking and the theory. You know, you put actively sporulating mushrooms in your basket, you walk through the woods or it's in your mesh bag and these spores are just being dispersed and you're helping to spread that species around the woods. And it sounds very good and I understand the sentiment is there, good intentions. But keep in mind that whenever you do harvest mushrooms, in the vast majority of cases, millions of spores have already been released. And in some cases, the vast majority of spores have been released. And so you're not really gonna make that big of an impact by walking around the woods, trying to disperse those spores through your basket or mesh bag. And if the mushroom is actively sporulating at the time of your harvesting, then walking around the woods, you'll be having those spores in your clothes. And so you will be distributing those spores, whether you're thinking about it or not. So I see this all the time online. People jump on each other's backs just because you're not harvesting in a mesh bag or a basket. But keep in mind that insects are great spore dispersal agents. The wind, animals as well, and you just naturally, just walking through the woods, you've got spores all over you. So mesh bags are great and baskets are great. And I like harvesting in baskets because it ensures a clean harvest. But as far as spore dispersal, just being out in the woods and touching various things, I'm helping to ensure that the species that I'm going after are being dispersed through my activity out here. Number 14, harvesting mushrooms in plastic bags is a dangerous practice. I would consider this a myth. Now look, plastic isn't my number one choice for harvesting mushrooms. I don't like to use a lot of plastic to begin with. As far as harvesting mushrooms, I like brown bags and wax bags, mesh bags. I like baskets as well. I like things that aren't necessarily made of plastic. However, if that's all you've got, rather than beat yourself up over it, rather than being embarrassed that all you have is a plastic bag, just put the mushrooms in the plastic bag and get them home. 
The thing is you don't want to store mushrooms for too long in plastic bags. But if it's all you've got in the woods, instead of just piling them into your t-shirt and walking three miles out of the woods, put them in the plastic bag that you have. If you only have a plastic bag, you'll be fine. Just get them home and don't store those mushrooms in the plastic bag because plastic does hasten spoilage. And that's where the theory that plastic is a dangerous practice when harvesting mushrooms comes from. You can harvest mushrooms in plastic bags. If you don't have anything else, it's fine. But I wouldn't necessarily store mushrooms long term in plastic. But again, my first choice would be baskets, mesh bags, wax bags, brown bags. If all you have is plastic, that's fine with me. Number 15, mushroom hunting is a dangerous practice. This is a myth. Now we are getting into mycophobia, the fear of mushrooms, the fear of fungi. It is rampant here in the United States in the 21st century. The general population fears mushrooms, fears the hunting of wild mushrooms, fears the consumption of wild mushrooms because we fear what we don't know. We are not taught here in North America, particularly in the United States, anything about wild mushrooms, anything about the fungal kingdom. Growing up, I was taught nothing about it. Even at my university level biology class, still we didn't learn anything about mushrooms. We skipped right over that. We talked about animals, we talked about bacteria, we talked about plants, but we skipped over the fungal section. So it's easy to fear what we don't know. How did I get over that fear? I just learned. I just learned as much as I possibly could. I hung out with people who made me feel comfortable around mushrooms. And so whenever it comes to wild mushrooms, out of all the mushroom species worldwide, interestingly, only a small percentage of them are very toxic. Now yes, mushroom fatalities do exist. Every single year, mushroom fatalities are reported. We read about them in the newspaper, we read about them online, we hear about them through our mushroom clubs. So I don't wanna say that we shouldn't fear mushrooms at all, ever, because the small risk is there. There is a small risk with mushroom hunting. However, there's a great reward. Without a risk, there would never be a reward, and the reward is insane. The reward is massive, and it's that you get to connect with your land, you get to connect with the fungal kingdom in the most intimate way by ingesting it, by going out, foraging something that grows in the land where you live and putting it into your body and making it a part of you. And that's a beautiful thing. So the antidote to mycophobia is learning. It's knowledge. And last but certainly not least, number 16, there are hard and fast rules to determine whether a mushroom is edible or not. Clearly this is a myth. Obviously, this is a myth based on everything that we talked about. There are no hard and fast rules that you can apply to mushrooms to determine whether they're edible or not, other than just learning each species one at a time. I get asked the question often, a few times a week, hey Adam, how do I know which mushrooms in my woods are edible? How can I tell? Is there some kind of chemical that I can apply? Can I scratch it? Can I smell it? Is there anything about it that'll tell me that it's edible or not? Is there some kind of thing that I can apply to it? Well, if you could do that, then you would have a billion dollar idea. If you could devise some kind of kit that'll tell you if a mushroom's edible or not on the spot just like that, you'd be a very, very successful person. But I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon for every single species of fungus because nature's way too mysterious for that. Way too complex, way too intelligent, and it demands so much more of us at the same time. It demands that you be intelligent at the same time. It demands that you learn each species one at a time, that you learn the edibility status of each mushroom one at a time. So there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to the edibility status of a mushroom. You can't look at a particular feature, and say, yep, it's edible, yep, it's medicinal, yep, it's toxic. You just gotta learn them one at a time. So that was an assortment of myths surrounding the foraging, the harvesting, and the consumption of wild fungi. Of course, we could have covered a couple of more, but those are some of the main ones that are out there today. And whenever you're learning about wild mushrooms, you'll often read some things that might go against your experiences or might not sit well with you intuitively. And I'd encourage you to look into those issues more deeply and not take everything at face value. Don't even take everything that I say at face value. Look into issues more deeply. You know, the last thing that I want anybody to do is to be turned off and turned away from foraging for mushrooms because there's just too many rules and it's not fun anymore. Yes, it's important to be safe, to be responsible, but it's also important to have fun. Thanks for watching this video. Have fun foraging wild mushrooms.